Thanks for tuning in at Brackies. Hello everyone and welcome to video number 6 on creating a tower defense game in Unity. Today we are going to be focusing on something very essential to the game, which is building turrets. So without further ado, let's just dig right into it. So you can see that I'm here in Unity and what I want to focus on is each of these individual nodes. So if we go ahead and find our prefab, node prefab here under the prefabs folder, let's go ahead and add a component to this called node. And let's go ahead and open this up in Visual Studio. So the node script here is going to be responsible for, whoops, let's do that one more time, is going to be responsible for keeping track of whether or not we have something uh, built on top of that node. It will also handle some user input. So it will make sure to uh, kind of highlight the node when we hover over it to uh, give the user some visual feedback that he can actually press it and something will happen. It will also be responsible for checking whether or not the uh, player has pressed that particular node and then building something on top of it if not if something isn't there already. So that's what we're going to be using this script for. Let's begin by making it clear to the user that he can build something here by creating a hover animation. And the way we are going to do this is using void on mouse enter. And this is a callback function used by Unity just like start or update or on collision. And uh, it's basically called every time the mouse enters uh, the confines of the collider of this object. So every time the uh, mouse just passes by or enters the collider, this is going to be called. And it's only going to be called once when you do that. So it's not going to call continuously when you hover over. And this makes it a great place to change the color of our object. And the way we do this is by calling get component and finding the renderer component that sits on our object. That's this one right here. And that's of course responsible for keeping track of our material. So we can go ahead and find our current material, which is just the first one in the list here. And because we only have one, that's our default material. And then that material has a color that we can set. So we're going to set that equal to some color and let's go ahead and make that color defined in the inspector. So let's make a public color up here, which is going to be our hover color and simply close that off. And we can then put our hover color down here. And this is going to work just fine. However, I really want to optimize this just a bit. So uh, instead of finding the renderer each time our mouse enters the collider, let's only find it once at the very beginning of the game and then cache it, which means store it in a kind of, uh, in a private variable uh, which only purpose is storing this information so we don't have to uh, get it all the time. So uh, let's make a private renderer and let's just call this a uh, rend and the reason why I don't call it renderer is that uh, renderer is a keyword used by Unity and then we have to go in and make a private new or write it and uh, that kind of stuff. So use rend or r or whatever and uh, then in the start method here I'm going to create a start method we're going to set rend equal to that get component renderer. And now we can, instead of using this entire piece of code, we can just put rend down here and that's going to work fine and it's going to be more optimized. Great, so uh, this is going to work. However, we also want to set the color back to the start color, the default color, uh, when the mouse exits the collider. So down here we're going to make a void on mouse exit and this does exactly what you would think it does. It's again a unity callback that is called when the mouse now exits the collider. And here we can set rent dot material dot color and because our uh, um, game object here, our nodes are white, we could just set it equal to color dot white. However, that would look weird if we later decide to change the color of our nodes. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to store our start color at the beginning of the game and then we can set it back down here. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're going to go ahead and make a private color variable and this is going to be our start color. And in our start method, we can set start color equal to rend.material.color. And now we've stored that as well and we can put that 
down there. So when our mouse enters, we're going to set our current um, uh, object color to hover color. And when it exits, we're going to set it back to the start color, which we make sure to get at the very start of the game. So if I save this now and uh, set our hover color to something that maybe would look a bit better than completely black, just some kind of gray here, we should see this working. So make sure you're hovering over inside the game view and you can see very clearly now uh, that uh, this animation is there and you really want to start pressing uh, these nodes now. Great, so make sure you always leave these small visual cues to let the user know where to press and um, yeah, good. So without further ado, let's jump back into our node script and uh, that was uh, the visual part. What we want to do now is we want to have this node store some information. And the first piece of information and maybe the most important piece is the turret that is currently built on top of this node. And if there is no turret build, we're simply going to have this variable be null. So we'll keep track of this using a private game object variable. And this is just going to be the current, uh, the current turret, or I'm just going to call it turret. And then we will have a, another method down here that is called only when we click that node. So as just like we have mouse enter and mouse ex exit, we also have on mouse down and this is called when we press uh, down the mouse button while hovering over that object. And uh, here we want to say that if our turret is not equal to null, meaning that we have already built something here, well then we want to throw out some kind of message to the user saying, well, we can't build here because there's already something there. Later we might have something like selecting the turret and then selling it for uh, less money than what you bought it for, maybe upgrading it. Uh, and uh, we should definitely also uh, have this message here, this can't build there message. We should display that on the screen so that the user know why nothing is happening. But for now, we'll just display this in the debug.log. Uh, so, in, I mean, in the console. Uh, so we can maybe put in here to do uh, display on screen. Just to let us know. And then we will return out of this method. Great. So if our turret uh, is equal to null, meaning that if we don't have anything built here, we want to go ahead and build a turret. And uh, this is super easy. We've done this a million times. You reference some kind of prefab, you instantiate the prefab at a position and a rotation, and then you can do some stuff with it, like destroy it later or something like that. But that is the very basics. However, we might want to have, we definitely want to have more than one turret. Currently, we only have one turret type, just a standard turret um, it, with a standard range and damage and all that. It currently, does a lot of damage, but uh, later this will be kind of the beginning turret. And then you want stuff like maybe a missile launcher. You want something that slows the opponent. You could have something like a, a, a something with fire or whatever you want to do. Um, and you want the user to be able to select what turret to build. And there are multiple ways of doing this. My idea is that we create some kind of build manager that will have some kind of UI with different turrets that you will press. And after having selected one, you can then press on the nodes uh, to build them. So that's what we're going to do. And therefore, instead of just referencing this turret in here, let's go ahead and create that build manager right away. Just so we have a kind of a skeleton, uh, uh, kind of a... Uh, uh, rig to build on top of. So uh, we'll just draw this out here. So let's find our game master script or uh, game master object. Let's add a new component here called build manager. And this build, build manager is going to be very empty at the moment. Don't know why it does that. Let's try that again. It's going to be very bare bones. But uh, what we essentially need is some kind of private um, game object. And this is going to be our turret to build. And by default, this is not going to be equal to anything. It's not going to be equal to anything until we tell it uh, what turret we need to build. And then we want some kind of way of getting this turret to build. And therefore, let's make a public um, void 
uh, or actually a public game object uh, called get turret to build and we'll be able to call this from other scripts and it will return the turret to build so this is just a, a nice way of calling a method and then getting what turret we want to currently build <coughs> excuse me however we still need a reference to our build manager and you can see inside of our node here and uh, that we could go up here and add a uh, public build manager and then uh, save that and go in here and reference it. But then we would have all of these nodes storing their own reference to the build manager. And that would very quickly become, well, frankly, really annoying to deal with. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to delete that. And then we're going to go into the build manager and make this available without a reference. And the way we do this is by using kind of a very simplified version of what is called a singleton pattern. And a singleton pattern is basically a way to get the current or to make sure that there's only one instance of the build manager in the scene. There's only one build manager and making it easy to access that instance. So we will go ahead and create a public static variable public because we want to access, access it from without the class and static because we want this to be shared uh, by all build managers. We only want this to be one build manager, one that is central to the build manager type. And we will call uh, make this a build manager and we will call this instance. So this variable is a build manager inside the build manager. <laughs> it stores the build manager and it basically just stores a reference to itself. And that quickly becomes confusing. But if we now go into the and create a, uh, a wake method, which is called right before start, we can go in here and set instance equal to this. So what we're doing is basically every time we start the game, there's only going to be one build manager, which is this one. And it's going to call the awake method and it's going to say that this build manager right here, the one that we are writing the script in here, this build manager is going to be put into this instance variable. And this instance variable can be accessed from anywhere. So now we have a reference to that build manager. You can also see that a problem occurs if we then have multiple build managers inside of our scene. If we were to go in here and add another build manager here, go in and add another build manager, now we have a problem because now they will both call this awake method. And the first one will set the instance equal to this. And then the second one will set the instance equal to the second. And then instance can only be equal to one of them at a time. And then one of them will, will just sit idle and not be used at all. So uh, this is a really great way of doing it if you know that you only have one instance in there. And you can even make an error check. We could go in and say if, uh, we should put this above the current piece of code here. So if instance is not equal to null before we set it, well that means that it's been set before and then we can debug that log error that uh, more than one build manager in scene. And that's a problem. So we're going to return and just let ourselves know. Okay. Uh, and this final thing that we want to do here is make a, uh, let's do that down here to keep our singleton stuff up there, is make a reference to our standard turret. So we're going to make a public game object and this is going to be our standard turret prefab. And it will just allow us to drag the turret in there um, from the inspector. And then what we will do is we will have the turret to build default to that standard turret. So we will say that turret to build equals standard turret prefab right off the bat. And then later we can go in and change it by clicking on some other turrets and add a whole uh, piece of UI uh, to go with that. So our turret to build will just be our standard turret prefab. And when we then get the turret to build, it's going to return that. So in here, what we can say is we can simply say, uh, that we want to uh, store a turret to build in a temporary variable and we want that to be equal to build manager dot instance again we get the current build manager active dot and now we can say get turret to build and it's going to go in here call this 
and return the turret to build, which is, which is currently equal to the standard turret prefab. And then we can instantiate this as we've done many times before. We can go in here and say instantiate uh, the turret to build at our current position, transform.position with our current rotation, transform.rotation. Something like that. And then we want to set our turret up here equal to that instantiated object. So we set turret equal to that. And whenever we do this, we need to re remember to cast this into a game object. Again, it's just something you have to do. So if you find some of this code here with the instancing and the singleton patterns and stuff uh, to be confusing, I completely get it. I was very confused uh, by this in the beginning and uh, singleton patterns or at least these very similar ones is something that you can't really avoid when, when programming at least if you want to get a bit more advanced with it um, but uh, what you can do is now for now just just memorate how this works and then later you can try and understand why it is exactly that we do it this way so um, for now just try and see if you can remember it and then uh, don't worry about understanding it too much. So uh, cool, now we have instantiated the, this turret and everything should be working. So now we can jump back into Unity. We can clear the console. We can see that our build manager now has a standard turret prefab slot. And I'm going to go in here and rename our turret to the standard turret. And then we can have multiple different uh, turret versions in the future. Let's find our game master and drag our standard turret in there. And again, I just deleted the three turrets that we currently have in the scene. And now when I hit play, we should be able to actually build a turret. And you can see that we are. However, it kind of sits inside of our node object. So what we want to do is simply take this and offset it by 0.5 on the Y. So let's go in here and create a offset and we can make this a variable in here just like uh, the hover color so we are going to have a vector 3 and this is going to be the position offset and we can set that inside the inspector and then uh, down here we take our current position and we simply add onto that our position offset it's really that easy so now we can go in and find our node prefab and we can find our position off offset and set that to 0.5 on the Y and now when we hit play everything should actually be working. So if I go in here and I press this, you can see that our turret sits nicely uh, on top of the node. And you can see that no matter how many turrets are placed here, they are all working. And if I try and place a turret on top of another turret, so you can see I press here, it says can't build there to do display this on the screen. So now we're able to build turrets inside of the game and they will just immediately work. And we have a nice hover animation and we have a centralized way of dealing with what turrets we want to build called the build manager. So that was all for this video. I hope you were into, uh, able to understand most of it. And uh, if you were able to understand all of it, great job. If not, don't worry about it. And without further ado, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you so much to all of the awesome Patreon supporters who donated in July and a special thanks to Vixian, Fimazone, Andrew K and Lux Game TV. These videos wouldn't be possible without you.